Hello humans, I'm back again. You miss me? My nails are abysmal, but we're not going to talk about them and focus on the topic of this video. Earlier this year, the Hunger Games trilogy was released on Netflix in America, and with the release of its prequel, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, coming out in the latter half of 2023, I personally had my FYP full of Hunger Games content, specifically with creators such as Lucky Lefty, who were giving their own analyses on the Hunger Games trilogy and its deeper meanings. Now, part of me did wonder if the resurgence of Hunger Games content on my social media feeds was a result of Gen Z's nostalgia trip or just very clever TikTok marketing. But either way, it definitely helped spark the motivation I needed to revive this dying YouTube channel. Okay, so originally this video was going to be an analysis, analyses, analysis, on the marketing strategies of the original Hunger Games strategy, strategy, on the original Hunger Games trilogy and the press release of the prequel, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. However, a couple things happened between the time where I originally wrote the script for this video and the time that I'm recording it now. One of the first things being the SAG actors strike, which meant that there was no press run for the Hunger Games prequel. You know, there were no interviews, there wasn't a bunch of media storm and frenzy like there was for the original Hunger Games trilogy. So there wasn't much for me to talk about in terms of marketing, but one of the bigger points being the current genocide that is occurring in Palestine after Israel started its attack on Hamas. I'm no stranger to Suzanne Collins' original motivation for writing The Hunger Games, and with the current genocides that are happening in Palestine, Congo, Sudan, Tigray, Guam, Haiti, the list goes on, I wanted to have a deeper analysis on the effects of long-term war on a nation of people, and specifically how in tune it is with the Hunger Games core messaging. I do plan on making a book review for all of the novels within the Hunger Games trilogy because the 14-year-old in me just needs to, but this video is going to be a little bit different. Let's get into it. One, two, three, let's go! First book in the Hunger Games series, The Hunger Games, was published in 2008, with Catching Fire and Mockingjay being published in its consecutive years. This is the part in the video where I put on my glasses to read because I am blind and can't memorize parts of my script. The book appeared on the New York Times bestseller list for 260 weeks, that is five consecutive years, and there are more than 100 million copies of all three books in the trilogy in print and digital formats worldwide. By the time I had gotten my hands on the book in 2011, the film adaptation had been confirmed, which had reignited its popularity worldwide. I remember the series being so popular that there was a waiting list in my school library to be able to hire out the books, but I was a library assistant at the time, so I put myself on the tippity top of that list so that I could read those books ASAP. Me and my friends used to debrief every single lunchtime about how far we'd gotten into the book, who our favourite characters were, who was the cutest out of Peter, Gail, and Finnick? Best believe we were fangirling hard. 2011 also happened to be Tumblr's Prime, and you couldn't scroll for more than two seconds on that app without seeing some sort of overly filtered gif of Everlark or Peter versus Gail. This was the era that dystopian YA fiction was in its prime, and The Hunger Games was seen as top dog. I remember 11 year old me refusing to read the Divergent series because I saw it as a betrayal to the original best YA fiction, which was The Hunger Games, in my eyes. In March 2012, the long awaited Hunger Games film adaptation made it to theatres with a budget of 79 million and hit the box office with a staggering 694.4 million USD. The movie had a star-studded cast with actors such as Josh Hutchison playing Katniss's love interest Peter Mallard and Liam Henderson playing Katniss's other love interest who, although was still new to his acting career, had gained a little bit of notoriety due to his brother's status. This is also one of Jennifer Lawrence's first award-winning roles which pretty much landed her within Hollywood notoriety. The film also features some other recognisable actors such as Amanda Stanberg who plays Rue, Elizabeth Banks who plays Effie 
Lucky Trinket, and Lenny Kravitz, who plays Sinner. The film was a smash hit and placed itself in the Hall of Fame, with its competitors trying to live up to its notoriety, but in my opinion, never really making the same impact. The series won nine MTV awards out of its 26 nominations, seven People's Choice Awards out of its eight nominations, received three Grammy Awards and Golden Globe Award nominations, also winning a Grammy Award for Best Song Written for Visual Media for Safe and Sound. The Hunger Games marketing rollout was a work of genius. From the movie posters to the interviews to the behind the scenes footage of the actors on set, there was a surplus of content for you to fangirl over. I remember being 12 years old and absorbed in all of the visual content that I could get my hands over. I was going over every single interview from every single actor, trying to learn everyone's names, everyone's backgrounds, where they were from, other movies that they had been in, trying to develop some sort of relationship and understanding about the physical people who were portraying the figurative characters that I had already visualized in my head. Not to mention getting glimpses of all of the costumes that I was so obsessed about in the original trilogy and seeing them come to life. I resonated heavily with Rue within the books, specifically because she was around my age and she seemed like she had come from a similar background as myself, with us both being the same race. Now, race was never explicitly mentioned in any of the Hunger Games books, including the prequel, but Suzanne Collins has a very clever way of ethnically coding her characters so that she doesn't have to explicitly say what race a character is, but you can get a sense as to what background each character comes from. Rue specifically is described as having satiny brown skin with golden eyes and other people in her district having similar features, such as her fellow tribute, Thresh. Katniss similarly is also ethnically coded, being described as having olive tan skin, dark hair and grey eyes, something that would be more descriptive of someone with indigenous features, and her mother and her sister having fairer features with blonde hair and blue eyes. Since I was the same age as Rue in the book when I was reading it, I latched onto the actress that was playing her, and I think a lot of other people did too for other reasons. Whether you felt like you looked like a character Character, wanted to be a character or resonated with them on some sort of personal level, it was very easy to develop parasocial relationships with these actors that were representing characters that you might have been reading for years and years and years and form some sort of attachment with, as we all do with pieces of literature and media. Having a surplus of content enables you to be able to immerse yourself within characters. And that leads to people building a parasocial relationship with the actors who are portraying figurative characters. During the early 2000s, while surfing through TV, Suzanne Collins was inspired to write The Hunger Games. Reality TV was in its prime, with series such as The Bachelor, Survivor, and America's Next Top Model being network's biggest cash grabs. As Suzanne clicked from channel to channel, she would be presented with images of live conflict from the Iraq war and reality TV. I got the idea for The Hunger Games. I was lying in bed late at night one night, and I was channel surfing. And I found myself going in between reality television programs and footage of the Iraq war. And these images sort of began to meld together in my mind in a very unsettling way. And that's when it sort of struck me, this idea for the games. Similar to how some of us might be scrolling through TikTok and be presented with live footage of the Palestinian conflict and the south of Gaza Strip, and then scroll to a trending dance to some sort of sped up audio of a charting song. Collins states in an interview with the New York Times that in her previous work, The Underland Chronicles, that she had examined the idea of unjust war developing into a just war because of greed, xenophobia and long-standing hatreds, and for her next series wanted a completely new world and different angle into the just war debate. She furthermore discusses the topic of just war theory, stating that just war theory has evolved over thousands of years in an attempt to define what circumstances give you the moral right to wage war and what is acceptable behaviour within that war and its aftermath, the why and the how. It helps us differentiate between what's considered a necessary and an unnecessary war. This movie title is going to be the death of me. 
The Ballad of Snakes, no, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is the prequel to the Hunger Games trilogy in which we're able to get an insight into the upbringing of future war criminal and president of Panem, Cornelius Snow. And yes, it's pronounced Cornelius and not Cornelius. Don't ask me why, capital names are weird. In the book and the film, we see his short-lived summer fling with the tribute that he is set to mentor from District 12, Lucy Gray Baird. A character that obviously has parallels to Katniss Everdeen with them being from the same district and I think also hinted being from the same ethnic background. But Snow is specifically paired with the female tribute from District 12 by his future enemy and his father's previous business partner, Dean Highbottom. The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes paints a picture as to the effects of the First Rebellion against the capital and its citizens. The once affluent and prestigious Snows are now scrounging to put a meal together. The only thing they've got to their name is their name. In the opening of the book, we see Snow along with his cousin Tigress scramble to be able to put together a presentable outfit for his formal school event, with the remaining parts of his father's sparse, luxurious wardrobe, with most of it being burnt for warmth in the war. His grandmother, or grandmam, although frail, sings her heart out to the national anthem of Panem every single morning. After losing her son to rebel leaders in the war, she is ever the patriot and convinced that all citizens of the districts are simply budding rebel killers. Her granddaughter Tigress, however, shows a more neutral point of view towards the war. Although having grown up wealthy and probably more aware of her family's affluence with her being the older cousin, is more sympathetic towards the suffering of district citizens. The inner circle of Coronelius Snow shows us the perfect example of the mindset of a colonizer. To seize a district, let alone a nation of different traditions, religions, ethnicities and cultures would lay heavy on any person's conscience. Therefore, to justify their actions, a colonizer has to rationalize it somehow. We see how the pressures of social status, poverty and tradition lay heavy on snow shoulders. Being the only male family member left in his family, he is the direct heir of his father's enterprise and lives directly within his father's shadow. Therefore, feeling the need not only to maintain his family's social status, but the want to reach further with dreams of one day becoming president. The pressure to maintain status quo can be compared to many great empires such as the Roman and the British, and current world powers such as America are no strangers to the same fate. We often look back on history and wonder how people sided with oppressors, but the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes gives us a great example onto how citizens of an oppressive state can also suffer from long-term effects of a war, and how their suffrage can make them more susceptible to the oppressive state's cause. We know from the original trilogy that the other districts are essentially forced to produce materials for the capital. District 1 being luxury items, 2 being masonry and defence, 3 general electronics, 4 being fishing, 5 is power and electricity, 6 is transportation, 7 is lumber, 8 is textiles, 9 is grain, 10 is livestock, 11 is agriculture, 12 is coal mining, and the once 13th district was in charge of nuclear weaponry, but this district was supposedly obliterated during the rebellion. We learn from the prequel that the Snows were able to accumulate their wealth through nuclear weaponry, so when District 13 is destroyed within the First Rebellion, the Snows' wealth goes along with it. However, majority of Panem's wealth is hoarded within the capital, with the remaining districts not having their wealth evenly distributed. Districts 1 through 3 are regarded as being the most affluent districts, which is why majority of the careers are produced through there, and District 12 being the poorest district since coal is not readily used as a natural resource anymore. During the rebellion, one of the tactics used by the districts was to cut off the supply chain to the capital, one of the reasons why capital citizens suffered so much during the first rebellion. Food became so scarce within the capital that Snow remarks seeing his very prestigious neighbour resorting to cannibalism out of starvation. The war that inspired the Hunger Games, the Iraq War, was triggered by Iraq stating that they were no longer going to be trading their oil in American USD and rather switching to euros, which would effectively ruin the American economy as we knew it. What are the Hunger Games? Well, 
After an accumulation of many oppressive years from the capital, the other districts banded together in hopes of rebelling against the oppressive force. As a reminder of the capital's control over the other districts and the lives lost within the first rebellion, a male and female tribute are chosen by random out of each of the 12 districts to fight to the death in an annual event. That was very hard to say. Terrible war. Widows, orphans, a motherless child. This was the uprising that rocked our land. Thirteen districts rebelled against the country that fed them, loved them, protected them. Brother turned on brother until nothing remained. And then came the peace. Hard fought, sorely won. A people rose up from the ashes and a new era was born. But freedom has a cost. When the traitors were defeated, we swore as a nation we would never know this treason again. And so it was decreed that each year the various districts of Pan Am would offer up in tribute one young man and woman to fight to the death in a pageant of honor, courage, and sacrifice. The lone victor, bathed in riches, would serve as a reminder of our generosity and our forgiveness. This is how we remember our past. This is how we safeguard our future. I just love that. The Hunger Games are a spectacle in itself, a reality TV show in which capital citizens are able to bet on their favourite victors and send them survival aid such as water, food and medicine if they like characters enough. However, in the prequel, we learned that the Hunger Games actually wasn't so popular with capital citizens, and by the 10th Hunger Games, the viewership was lower than ever and the capital was even considering scrapping the games altogether. This is why Coronelia Snow and his classmates are set with the task to be the first mentors of the Hunger Games. These mentors are set with the task to make the Hunger Games grander than ever, and the winner of this class assignment would win the Sojanus Prize, which is a huge financial prize that Coronelia Snow specifically needs because he cannot afford his university tuition and also just needs the money to be able to maintain his family's social status. Why is the capital so concerned with viewership? Surely it would be more cost effective to scrap the games altogether because the capital has only just recovered from financial ruin as an effect of the rebellion. In order to justify the brutal force that the capital then uses to control the other districts, they have to justify it somehow by making an example out of the districts. Cornelius says it best. The war is impossible to end, we have to control it indefinitely. With peacekeepers occupying the districts, with strict laws and reminders of who's in charge, like the Hunger Games. In any scenario, it's preferable to have the upper hand to be the victor rather than the defeated. Sejanus is Snow's classmate and a previous citizen of District 2. It is not common for people from the districts to be able to move into the capital, however Sejanus' father was able to accumulate a mass amount of wealth during the First Rebellion and buy his way into the capital. Sejanus still very much sees himself as a citizen of District 2 and is very opposed to the idea of the Hunger Games. When Dr. Gaul, the head game maker, asks the class why the Hunger Games exists, Sejanus is very vocal in his disposition towards the Hunger Games, calling it immoral. That the oppressor has no right to take away someone's life and freedom. That having more weapons doesn't give you that right. That winning a war doesn't give you that right. However, his classmate Livia retorts that it's not immoral to defend ourselves. Time and time again, we see people with great power use many an excuse to justify their violence towards others. The scramble for Africa was justified under the guise of civilization, therefore Africans needed to be portrayed as beasts to be tamed. Through the lens of Katniss, we see the capital's true ignorance towards its work and control over the other districts. She sneers at her prep team's lack of social awareness while they giggle and gaggle over designer gowns to dress up tributes who are literally about to fight for their death, while girls in her own district are selling their bodies in order to put food on the table. Katniss and Peter sneer at the capital citizens' offering of a drink to help them throw up so that they're able to eat more food, because Katniss is literally risking her life every single day back home in order to hunt so that she can sell food for money and put food on the table for her family. 
The reason why Snow's proposal for The Hunger Games works is because building a parasocial relationship with the tributes, learning their backgrounds, their ethnicities, their tradition, their cultures, their hobbies, gives you emotional attachment to see them survive. Many have noted that the effect the Palestinian conflict is having on the current younger generation is quite different to the effect that other past tragedies in the world had on younger generations. And that's because through social media, we are forming parasocial relationships with people we are seeing live within Gaza. People like Bassan, Plestia, and Motaz, we see every day documenting their lives, telling us what's happening in Gaza. We're seeing the first hand effects of what war does to people within a country. A father having to close his daughter's eyes for the last time. Doctors discovering that amongst the many bodies that they're treating are their family and friends. However, that means that we also could become desensitized to the effects of war on a people. There is a possibility that our generation could become desensitized to the effects of war on a people. Constantly being presented with images of the Palestinian conflict, among many others, starts to become your normal. One of the things uh, that concerns me, and it goes back to that moment of inspiration where I'm clicking between the reality television programming and uh, the Iraq war, is um, we see so many images coming at us on television, over the internet, you know, on your Blackberry, whatever. You see so many images that do they all begin to have a sameness to them? Are you really distinguishing between the different things that you see on different channels? Are you really distinguishing if you're flipping through quickly? And I worry more about younger people, though maybe I shouldn't, maybe it's equal for all of us. When you flip from the game and then you flip to the war and then you're back on something else. We also live in the same parallel that we can build parasocial relationships with victims of war and slowly become desensitized to the larger and more important matters. Simply liking a post or sharing a hashtag and then continuing your day to day. Myself among many have noted how hard it is to continue our day to day lives while the world is literally on fire. How can we comfortably have after work drinks or mold wine at a Christmas market or come home to a warm house and a meal when children of war are literally being given toys of food that they're not able to eat? How did the capital citizens become so desensitized to the Hunger Games? The irony is they didn't. The Hunger Games became popular again through glamorized trauma porn, feeling like you can make a difference to others who are in a more vulnerable position through you, maybe for your own financial gain, but only after you're able to see how your financial donation was able to support that person in live action. The injustices of others is not an online spectacle for us to sympathize with and scroll. Neither are we expected to stop our day-to-day -day lives in order to support others. That would be redundant. However, the glamorization of war and exposure of violence over time can unfortunately make us feel numb. Thank you so much for listening to this video essay. I worked on this script for a very long time. I don't know if I feel like I hit all of the points that I wanted to make, but it was just a general discussion that I wanted to have with my audience that I felt like maybe you would be interested in listening to, maybe, sort of. I, hope. I definitely will be doing a book review on the hunger games and i think i'll highlight a couple more points about war within those reviews as well as a couple more tiktoks i would definitely love to keep this discussion going with any more points that you have about a uh, long-term war and its effect on people especially with the uh, effects of social media that we haven't had compared to other injustices that have happened in the past. I'm hoping that I can build a community specifically on YouTube that is a fan of critical thinking on media and culture and how it affects the world today. Things that are lighthearted, but also the darker and more important serious things in the world as well. I have been filming this video for hours to the point where my voice is dry. Okay, yeah, I have nothing else to say. Bye.